So uh, Justin uh, has joined us today to talk about uh, Go Language. And Justin works at the NCSA, he's on the security operations team. He's a developer for the Bro project. He's working on uh, revamping or revising Bro control. And um, he's also developed a number of uh, free and open source tools like Passive DNS, Dumno, Black Hole Router, HTTP Flood, and Netflow Indexer that are being used in various places. So uh, go ahead and uh, kill the. Uh, oh, you went ahead and took it from me. Good job. Sure. Uh, see, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Go. I'm not like an expert programmer. It's the kind of thing I've been tinkering with on the side. Uh, to me, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Primarily, it's an easy language to use. Like the tooling's nice. So I'll just kind of jump right in and just start talking about some stuff. Like really triple your font. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and we can just go into the go into here. So the nice thing about I can also use Atom. My friend really likes Atom and keeps pressuring me to use it. It's really slow on OS 10 though for some reason. It starts up instantly on my uh, thing that uh, running Linux. But, uh, but anyway, I'll get to that in a second. So with them, I have some, them of, the stuff, some of the Go stuff. So it looks like very much like C. So, you know, you do a package Thank name, you so. which you have to do, and a font name. And, you know, you don't actually have to return zero. See, so if I save that, it works. So, actually, let me start a separate screen. So, flip between the two. So, to start this, so I just ran some code. Let's make it actually do something. We need to use printf. Hello. <laughs> And that should complain that format is undefined. So you just need to import from that. I think in Atom, I have it do the thing where it'll automatically import it for me. And what's neat is Go is really picky about warnings. Like, I don't think there are warnings. Everything's an error. So, like, if I get rid of that line, now it's not going to compile because I imported it, but I didn't use it. So, it's, sometimes it's a pain, but it really kind of forces you to write code that's not crap. Like, you're not going to have imports that you're not using. You're not going to have variables that you're not using. Like you really have to make like dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Otherwise, you can't even compile it. So now I can run this. And so what's nice is okay. Say you want to distribute the binary to some other box. You use go build instead. Um, it yeah. So because my directory is called go, that's the project. But I think it'll work if I do that. So now I have a binary. And it's that same process, even if I had like 50 source files and you know multiple binaries, you don't do make files for the most part. You don't need to. It's they're really big on convention over configuration. So as long as you kind of put the files in the same place and call things in the same manner, you just build the build, it'll build. So let's go out. When you do go run, is it is it compiling or is it interpreting? It's compiling, yeah. It compiles it to like a temporary directory okay. and runs it. One of the things about Go is that the compiler is crazy fast. So even like, you know, multi thousand line, you know, ten, twenty thousand line projects with lots of files, it compiles it to the instant. So yeah, you it it it'll run hello.go faster than like Python will run. The Python hello. Even compiling it and then running the binary. When you rewrote uh yeah. Brocut in C and then did it in Go, what was yeah. the difference like? Was it significant or so it was, it was awk, and I wrote it in Go, but it really wasn't much faster than the Python version. And that was mostly just because it couldn't optimize it as much as you could in C. Because okay. it was still doing all the memory allocations and allocating all the temporary strings that you were just throwing away. And there might be a way in Go to do, I, I think, I've seen some libraries for things like buffer pools and things like that. But in C, you can just read in like a single like line do the pointer stuff to split the columns and directly write it to standard out and then overwrite that string. So the reason why the C version is so fast because it never allocates memory and it makes like one pass over the string. Okay. So you're never going to get another language as fast as that. Um, but anyway, so that's like hello. Um, the standard library has lots of useful things like there's, you know, a strings function or a strings module. And so if I did 
do you, to do something like, is there just like a normal print, like a simple print? Yeah, yeah. Like in Python or something? Yep. Yeah, so if I did string, hello world. Can you world. do a for that? Or it's, everything's under the format module. So it's like okay. format print my string. Let's get rid of this for a second. So you see we can run that, hello world. There is a print an L or print L. I always get that backwards. I always think print new line, which would be print NL, but that's not. The nice thing about it is, so let's say parts. You know, it's, it's a typed language, but you generally don't need to tell it the types because you can just, that's basically like auto and C. Um, string. Uh, now we're going to print parts. So one nice thing is that it, not enough arguments. arguments. So it tends to know how to print things, even if it's like an array or some crazy data structure. So the nice thing is there's a couple of nice when you're using printf. I think Q is these are all documented. But it, it's some stuff that makes it easy to work with, even though it's a compiled language. Like there's Q, there's V, I think V is the uh, representation, there's pound V will give you the like go representation. So it kind of makes it easy to work with a data structure. You don't quite know what it is. You can just print out the full representation of it. And it'll, yeah. Like I don't think C++ still has something. Like, like you're never, you, you can get like the pointer, a continuous pointer, but like, cause that's kind of like what Perl would do by default. You gotta get like data dumper to like actually take a look. They make it pretty easy. And I think there's T for type. Oh yeah, that's the tagged version. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can format something, cool. or just have it kind of do what it thinks is right. Um, so, have you written anything? Yeah. So, so this is just messy. so. What I'm trying to get at here is it's very easy to work with, even though it's a compiled language. It generally doesn't feel like a compiled language. So I wrote some. So I think one of the first programs I'm going to have it here is Pipetail. I haven't actually looked at this in a while. I wrote a real long time ago. Um, yeah, Pipetail is kind of a low-level program that lets you dump a pipe into it, and it just kind of shows you the end of it. So if I were to run like sec, I'll, probably won't work too well on the video, but you know, run sec, it's going to output tons of numbers, and you might want to just keep an eye on that without having to dump it all the way to your screen. So you can pipe it to pipe tail. And it's just gonna every couple of seconds give you what like the last bunch of lines was. Which can be useful if you're working on like a slow connection where you don't want it to constantly update the screen. And I just kind of there for fun. Uh, so one nice thing about Go is that it has really good HTTP support. So this little program I can make it a little bigger, but try to fit the whole thing. So we got some imports, the log module, HTTP module, strings module. And so this is the whole program. So this program makes a web server that when you hit it, responds with your IP. And you laugh, but there's like, you know, actual like, websites on oh, the right. internet. Oh, how key lines of code it was. Yeah, so there's, it's a useful thing like to have in your infrastructure sometimes. It's just like a box, especially with NAT and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, a box that you can hit that'll just tell you what your IP is. So yeah, so that's the whole thing. With the basic HTTP support, you give it a handle function, and then a function where you get a writer and the request. The, about as basic as you get. It's pretty much the hello world, but use something on the respect, on the response. So the one thing I wrote to play around a little further is trace route me, which kind of builds on that same difference, except I'm trying to fit more here. And 
instead of just writing something, it's replaced with these lines that use the um, exec module to exec trace route with the IP and set the standard out of the process to the response writer object. So basically it execs the command and sends it right to the output. So this is kind of boring because it's hopefully trace route me. Start that out. So that's basically like a web enabled trace route API. So still somewhat useful, you know, if you had that on a server somewhere on the internet and you hit it like I don't know if my IP is actually reachable. The uh, I think it's a NAT IP here. But I guess if you guys are on it, you could try curling that IP port 9000. Which again, you're also still probably on the same subnet as me, so it's not going to do anything very interesting. So, 2, Yeah, port 9000. Yeah, I got two. two. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. So, my log, I see trace routing to you. So, so yeah, very easy to write kind of little simple tools like this uh, that do networking like that. So, moving on, just other neat things you could do. So, I was playing around with uh, the idea to write and map kind of gateway. So, I actually wrote a first thing I wrote, which shows you how to parse um, JSON or XML and go. It's a little verbose. Since it's not very dynamic, you can't just say parse this blob with XML. You have to kind of define the structures. So, you know, a scan result is a structure that contains a scan info, and then the scan info contains services and posts, and all those contain further structures, just making your way down the structure. But then what's nice is then you just tell it, okay, parse it, and it'll tell you if it was able to map it to that structure. So, I have some code. And then, so the nice thing is, Go actually supports tests. No test file. I did that wrong, didn't I? Oh, I guess I never actually wrote test cases for that. But it's Go has the Go tool also has testing built in, so you can just write your test cases and run Go test, and it'll run them. I'm still still not learning how to do that. Um, and the nice thing is it also has benchmarking built in. So if you have a test that you want it to run it like 20,000 times, it'll immediately support that. And then someone else wrote a tool building on that called like benchmark differ or something. So if you make a code change, you can tell it to run all your benchmarks and then it'll tell you if it was faster or slower. Hmm. So there's like so many tools that make it really easy working with the code. Um, but yeah, so I built another simple like HTTP server for Go. Very similar to like the trace route one, except I added basic security support, which ended up being like a couple of lines to check a token. And from this point on, it's the same as the trace route. And then another interesting thing that I was playing with, and this is where Go kind of gets interesting that it supports so many things like this. You can have it do SSL. So with one binary that's running this API server, you can give it a certificate and a PEM file. And instead of just telling it to do HTTP, you say do listen and serve TLS. So now this nmap press server, oops, that's actually, I guess, a Linux binary. So build nmap press. In trouble, not too happy. So this is now started up uh, HTTPS. So I can tell it hit slash scan host equals localhost with no password by default, and it's going to scan localhost. So that's a web-enabled NMAP gateway, essentially. So what's neat is then I can set some code. Let's have a name up here. NMAP rest. So I check this environment variable auth token. So if instead, if I run it, auth token equals log and map rest. Now if I try to request it, it'll say authorization failed. Once I type log as the password. So really, in you know a handful of lines of code, twenty lines of code. So and map 
So 50 lines of code, it's a HTTP server with built-in SSL and authentication to be like an NMAP API gateway. So you can accomplish a lot. A lot of it's based on the strength of, you know, the standard libraries. So, so. And Go produces static binary, yep. so you don't actually need to have libraries. Yep. So that's really so, cool. yeah. One of the projects I've been working on the longest, which is kind of like my test bed for learning some new stuff, is this thing called HTTP flood, which is an HTTP server that just sends you data. You connect to it, it sends you random data really, really fast. Um, so, and so like link the binary. So I have a file here just because there's some like flash stuff that I built, but really to build the regular binary is literally just, uh, yeah, go build. So this is a package that has some cons defined. I have some helper classes, some like web stuff. So I just type go build, it built it. No, doesn't use the make file. It just auto discovers all the files in here and names the binary after the directory I'm in. So very easy to work with. So what's interesting, so start this up in server mode. And I have a Chrome, and that starts up this server. So it's a single binary. The thing that's popular in Go these days is packing the static assets into the server. So it's actually a single binary that has all the templates and the files. So what it does is it gives you some links. So if I take this link to one gigabyte file and go back over to here, so if I wget send this to dev null, that's going to send me a gigabyte of random data, and very fast. It's about like twice as fast on one x, but so that's. 1.40 gigabytes a second, so that's 15 gigabits over loopback. So, and the nice thing is, like I ran this at Albany, it was very useful because you often get system ins that want to do like a performance test. They're like, I think the network is slow. And you ask them, oh, can you run iPerf? And they're like, oh, I don't know how to install that on like AIX or something like that. The nice thing about HTTP flood is that it's just HTTP. So pretty much every OS has like a Lynx or a curl or like even OpenBSD, their FTP tool can do HTTP download. And Windows, the power shell has this all. Well, the nice thing is you can build, you can easily cross compile this to a Windows EXE and just give someone an EXE and then say, here's your client, which I've done that too. Right, right. Um, so yeah, so it's, what's interesting is Go is built around this concept of like writers and readers. Um, so the way you make this work is I wrote some uh, structures and functions called like random readers where it satisfies the like read API that just gives it random data. And Go actually already had something built in for like a byte limited reader and I wrote my own timed reader. So it has another mode where you can say instead of um, giving like a number of megabytes, you can say just test for five seconds and it'll just give you random data for five seconds. So, and the neat thing is, so once you write these random readers that know how to give random data and things like that, the server just ends up, I think, yeah, just ends up going IO copy. So you get your like random reader and the HTTP request has a writer. So you just say, okay, copy the data to the client and go to the rest. And very fast. So, and what's neat is I pack into the binary. Um, I wrote a flash version in that packs language, or say it, so you can actually test it in flash. So you can just give someone a link to the site, and they can benchmark it. Like actually, can you go to it? So you remember my IP from a couple minutes ago? I got it. Yeah, just go to it in your browser port 7070. You'll see if he connects, I should get a. Uh, yeah, see this on the flash application? Yeah, the start button. You have to hit run. Start. Okay. Yeah, so see, flood starting from your address, five seconds. Five, and flood finish, 33 megabytes, 6.6 .6 megabytes a second. So, like. 
some like networking group might like something like that. Cool. And really, the nice thing is that it is just HTTP, so you don't need fancy clients or anything like that. I actually really like the API so much. We can use a lot of that for NSM as well. So, so having the wall do the actual wall do the right thing. Yep. And it, I have some like staff here, I think. It's like debug bar. Yeah, so it actually does JSON. So here, I'll, I'll demo something with that GQ because this is kind of a blob. But I curl that and send it to GQ. You get all the stats. Like some of this comes from Bro or Go, and then you can add your own. So we did seven downloads, 17,000 megabytes. Oh, there's a lot of nice stuff in it. We didn't really talk about channels. Like Go has lightweight routines. So like if I make a a funk and then oh, I can't call it. And arg is a string. So we're gonna print just All this stuff. Thanks for the talk, man. Sure. Sorry, I have to go. Wait, is it? No. Oh, um, so can you make sure that this and all of its cords end up in that plastic box and just leave it right there? Perfect. Can you make a channel? So I forgot how to do this, but it's take me a second to figure it out. I want to uh, ah, see you can make channel. Yeah, I just need a channel to wait, even though it's never gonna finish. And then for now, read from that channel. So if I run this, yeah, it's gonna A and B and then good luck. But what I want to do, I forget how to sleep. So, Mr. What's go stuff? Oh, uh, you'll see in a second. So, time dot sleep. I think you have to do one dot time dot second. Yep, that's about right. Maybe. So now we're just going to do a for loop, which when you do it like that is an infinite loop. So now you'll see I have basically two go routines running, which are like threads. So you can do concurrent programming. Does it, do they are actually threads within the operating system? No, they're lightweight threads. Go has like the schedule built in. Oh. You can tell Go there's a variable on how many actual processes to run, so it'll load balance across them. Because oh, generally, you only need to run as many cores as you have. Yeah, yeah. So like, and you know, it's like they're blocking, but I still get to a second. So you know, A sleeping for a second doesn't cause B to sleep for a second. And then I think is then you can have channels. So I can say, so I say, I am the asleep for five seconds, but then give it that channel of uh, ch chan of string. So I'm going to pass that channel in. So what I'm going to do is print f I got back and then read from that channel and call that twice. So actually I'm gonna wait five seconds, let's do, just do two seconds. So now when I run that, so A is running, B is running, sleeping, oops, sleeping one, two seconds. Oh, I just I didn't do what I was gonna say I was gonna do, which is uh, Right R back to C. So after two seconds, it gets back the data from those two functions. So using like basic primitives like these, you can do kind of scatter gather stuff. Like instead of passing A and B, say I passed a URL. And instead of returning the thing I gave it, it could return the contents. 
So if you wanted to parallel fetch a bunch of URLs, you can just write a function that fetches one, call them in different guru teams, mm -hmm. and you know, send out a bunch of requests and get a bunch of responses back. And it makes it very easy to do things like this. Cool. Uh, so like a lot of the stuff like the HTTP server and things like that, all these go routines uh, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. That's why like multiple requests won't block for other requests. So yeah, and generally it's a very nice language that's really easy to work with, especially with the tools. Like I don't know if you've noticed, like if I format this little wrong, the semicolon, you know, just make it just extremely ugly. One of the things they did with Go early on is they shipped a standard formatter. So everyone uses the formatter. You just you just don't not use it. Really? There's one way to make code look. And it's that's really cool. And it's similar I to how like that. Python, you know, indentations and force and things like that. Yeah. With Go, they're really serious about it. But it makes it easy to learn. If you're reading someone else's code, it looks like your code. That's right. And it's I think some people uh, you know, people don't really appreciate but I So what is it what fix that right there? Is that your Vim editor and a plugin? Or yeah, Vim, there's a add on for Go and it runs the Go tool that does the formatting. Is that gonna run automatically then when you when I save, yeah. yeah. And it works the same like I have uh been messing with the Atom editor. So Adam will do a similar thing. So you know I tab this over, this is all wrong. You know, lots of spaces. As soon as I hit save it just fixes everything. And it has so Adam has really nice errors, tells me every, you know, everything's screwed up. If I send, you know, you know, a thing there that doesn't make sense, tells you. And it'll do auto-completion, so it'll, it's, it knows all the different functions. So yeah, it makes it really easy. easy. Auto-completion then for programming. Yeah, I have some things, not as much as, uh, Adam package for Goda out of the box. It just makes it really easy just to work with the code. Well, like, and it'll do things. So, like, if I if I imported the string and don't use it, it just removes it. I'm not sure string if it if I have the thing enabled, it will add it for me. Oh, no idea. So, see, I I used the strings and it imported it. And if I delete that line. It'll remove it. So there's really it's. Can I do that in Vim too? Uh, I don't have it do that in Vim now. And one nice thing about Go is the way it's all built is um, I don't know if any of my programs. Oh yeah, uh, HTTP flood does I think maybe. Yeah, uh, the way you do like related imports is you use a URL, even if it's your project. So that's how all the Go tools like know how to pull down dependencies. It actually uses Git behind the scenes. And there's some issues with that with like versioning, but there's a bunch of solutions that are starting to mature. So like if someone else had a module that you wanted to use, you just import it, you give it the path, and you build your project, and it just does the rest. So it makes it really easy to work with other projects. Did you just start working group? Or did you uh, like, yeah, I have like this checked out. This is one of Bitly's projects. So if I like open up one of their, that I guess doesn't depend on anything. This should uh, Oh, it actually doesn't say HTTP. That's why I couldn't find it before. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. So, okay. trying to find a good example. I guess they mostly the Go standard library does have so many things in it that I guess they don't really even need to import much. You probably a power adapter. Yeah. So you can see here they're they're uh, loading, loading you know other projects. So like here's the big Go project. I'm pretty sure uh, I we go go something individually. Oh, 
oh yeah, I did this wrong. You're not supposed to do it like I did. It. You're supposed to just, as long as uh, GoPath is set, I would be able to do go get github.com slash bit.ly nsqnsqd. And now, so that just uh, go install. Let's go get and go install. Right here. That did a lot of work, but I don't have the binary, which is confusing me. Huh. I thought. That's why I'm still learning how this stuff works. I know it generally works. Like I know like in my go being directly so I have HTTP flood there. So if I delete that and I wanted to get my own project HTTP flood. Pretty sure. So put it back. So like if you had go on your system and you wanted to install HTTP flood, you run this. And it'll check it out, build it, and stick it in your go bin directory with one command. Sure. And oh yeah, so I have Gox, so that's neat. Um, go again. Do I have Gox in my history? I don't know how about it. So that Go is what does the or Gox is one of the tools that helps you with the cross compiling. So I think you go into here and just run. Oh yeah. <laughs> so some of those didn't actually didn't any of them work. Go try it. Basically, if I, I guess I don't have the cross compilers installed, but if I did, it would have just built the binary for all those platforms. Which is not because I know I was building the Linux binaries. That's odd. Yeah, I, I built something that I put on one of our servers that I built using Go. It's odd that it doesn't work now. Have you done anything with the, uh, like how you, do you know how you can just like query an API and like parse JSON data? Like, oh, fairly straightforward. So what, uh, yeah. So like GitHub or something? For sure, yeah. That's for fun, write a program to do that. So that's really what I'm trying to learn now. Um, I might start doing with Go, or like how you don't have to do Chrome on version. I mean, Yeah, it's for deployment. For deployment. Like, like it's, it's clearly not like exactly. So, Okay, so I've actually never done a um, HTTP client, so let's learn how to do this. So Golang HTTP, there is an HTTP client, and the documentation is pretty good. So yeah, so this is what we need, right, to get something, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to say uh, import, what do we got to import? The net HTTP. Actually, we don't, because my thing will do it for me. Uh, main. Oh, don't forget package main. So you have a URL. Remember how to get the URL to that thing you're using? GitHub API. Yeah. Just have GitHub API. Or well, you have the URL. Um, cancel switch. Do I have issue? Uh, API dot GitHub dot com. Oh, there's some, uh, oh, so yeah. Here, why don't I just hit this? This is JSON, right? Or I guess that's kind of boring. So issues. Oh. How did you get your issues? Um, here, it's, uh, it's uh, that. slash repo slash John Ship slash pilot slash issues. John Ship pilot slash issues. And then you pass the parameter say equals all for all of them. I don't know what you want to do there. I don't know what else it takes. Maybe closed and open, probably. That work. All right. Let's go your name. J O A S T H. Oh, yeah, you don't have an H. No H for you. 
And the funny thing is, there actually is probably, if I search for GitHub Golang uh, API, yeah, go GitHub, library for accessing the GitHub API. So let's use that. Am I still, oh, I'm still sharing. So, so all I need to do is import it. Don't need to download it. Oh, and I can't do that because it'll go away. So I need to use it first. So. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. See you. Oh, yeah. See you, Brian. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Right, I'm using it. So, new client. Let's see how to get issues. Or is there a documentation? Uh, documentation. Go doc reference. Uh, GitHub. So that's how you make a client. We don't need to authenticate. So let's search for issues. Issues service. Wow, this is a pretty comprehensive. <laughs> Yeah, the support. Let's be something for listing repositories because that should be a little easier. Oh, list all the issues for the specified repository. Owner string, repro string. Okay. Oh, but I need an issue service. So how do you get an issue service? Go back up to the top. Should be. Okay. Thanks a lot. It's really interesting. Yeah, thanks. This is where I tend to not like API documentation. Is I have a GitHub client, but I need an issue service. So I'm actually just going to see. I think this, I think this example might do more. Oh. Down. This actually probably does pretty much close to what we want. Yep. So it looks like we call to get some options. Call that. Paste that in there. Then what you tend to do is if error is not equal to no, uh, Kind of like that. Undefined. Yeah. Oh, it's not that. I get fatal. Fatal. Oh, I'm thinking of log. The log module is very similar, but has a lot of nice features. So you can say log fatal error. So and it looks like this is what they do if it worked. All right. Pretty much their example, but change the little we'll use your name. John ship. So now, oops, we should be able to go run github.go. There's all your repositories. And probably do something with yeah. I think so, yeah. I bit to JQ. Oops. I think it didn't start with. <laughs> That's just a very, very large blob. But we should be able to do so. So now that we're using uh, client repos list gives us a repos object. Let's learn what a repos object is. Yeah. I'm afraid it's getting quite late for me as well. So it's interesting seeing how Go looks at run. So thank you for your. Yeah, I, I'm not the best person to really talk about it. I just like it. It's it's nice to work with. You know, you don't really spend too much time fighting, you know, the compiler or fighting, dealing with error messages. It's pretty clear about what it wants you to do. It is it's easy to work with, and unlike Python, it runs fast. Fast-ish, yeah. 
I mean, I when I was trying to write something to do like some file and string handling pretty fast, like Python with PyPy ran quite a bit faster. It used a ton more memory, but Go was fairly fast. I mean, the other nice thing is, yeah, it compiled tiny little static binaries that you just throw on the server and run. So. Uh, Python works with Python? Probably not. I know there's a lot of issues like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I should try PyPy, but I tried Python. Yeah, like it's PyPy's funny because you might have some like Python program that's like too slow, and then you just install PyPy and run it in PyPy, and it's like, oh look, it runs five times faster now. It's like maybe I guess I won't bother rewriting it in C or something because that's fast enough at this point. Thanks. Well, Sam. I want to try that. Yeah. All right, let's see. So the thing about it being like more statically typed is it's a little harder to just kind of mess around. So I got this like repo. I actually know what it is. Like so now I need to see client repositories list. The repositories is that repository service that I didn't know how to get to. We want very repository. Come on, so great about navigating your documentation on there. Okay, repository service we call list, and that returned. Oh, okay, it just returned a list of repositories. So there should be a type repository. PCK beyond with this then. Type repository. Oh, that at the top. Type repository. Type, okay. Well, wow, okay, type repository. So that's all the fun stuff that's in it. So all we need to do to output something a little nicer is instead of that, do four. We don't care. The repository. Don't care. Yeah, of the underscore. Uh, that would be the index, but we're not going to use the index. So we just want the R in the range of repos. So now we should be able to kind of do the same thing. Print ln of R. So basically, just factor out that loop. So we should basically just be kind of one step away from working nicely with that. Uh, with that list of repositories. Yep. So well now it's one per line. So now let's just say we want to output the capital main and let's say description, which might even autocomplete. Oops. Uh, so R and R main R dot description. So now we run that, and that should kind of do something useful. Ooh, that's not right at all. Yeah, oh, yep, because I used the wrong print function. We want print S. Oops, what did it just say there? Our name for print ever, S is wrong type, type string. Oh. So according to the oops, according to the documentation, it is a pointer to a string, which is odd. Mm -hmm. I've not really worked too much with that. However, dealing with it is not a problem. We just need to put the stars. Yeah. If not that, it's an ambush. Is Python a for? No, Python everything is passed kind of by main niche reference. So there we are. There's a list of all your repositories, name and description. Okay, cool. so, a little more verbose, mm -hmm. but now that we've worked it out, that's a pretty How do you know um, So I see that we're, we're, the all this data stored in R, right? You know, we're saying you know, from R, get the name portion, or get the description portion. Where do we see that? Where's it actually being placed in R, all that content? What line of code is that? Uh, this. So it's client repositories list gives us a repos list, yeah. which is a list of repositories, mm -hmm. and these are the repositories. 
ID, owner, name, full name, description, home page, created at, pushed at, all these fields. But when does it come to cover all? Because I just call it. Oh, that's here. For, normally this is indexed, we're not using it, are in the range of repos. So like in, in oh. Python, it's very similar. It would be for R in repos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so it's basically the that. same thing. Except they use colon equal sign for that? Yeah. And if we wanted to print out like what repository number it was for whatever reason, we could say I and then print out D I. I keep getting tab and it never takes me to the right place. So now every repository state will have the number. Mm -hmm. So that's so the thing is if you don't use it, see watch what happens. If you don't use the I, we put it back the way it was. We're going to get an error that, or will we? Thought we would. I guess we won't. Oh yeah, I declared it not used. That's right. So that's why you do the underscore, which means there's a variable there. I'm just not going to use it. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be plain. I got to wrap it up now. It's all the Sure. Yeah, thanks for doing all that. This is actually pretty cool. Yeah. I just had to make whether I'm pushing language I want to use now or Python. I I would do it Python. I mean, it's Go is going to be a bit frustrating because you have to be so precise. Python, like, cause, like watch this. You know, uh, so we had. I think they're doing Python library. Like, so here, watch this. So this is your your URL, right? So we can import requests. Emacs? Request, no. Request get URL JSON. So that's your data. So now we have, uh, oh, that's a method now. So that's your data. We can pretty print it. Say so. Hmm. Can't remember. So now you can see your same structure. So you wanted your, your issues, right? So this is a list of issues, right? You don't want a title. Essentially, just, just to get the board. Oh, so the list. So for I in data print I. So you said. It was still was called title. Yeah. See? So two lines of code. Uh, terrible. Mm -hmm. Let's see Python. Oh, it just means I'm using the regular Python. Yeah, what, what, what are you in right now? It's uh, just Python front end that makes it easy to experiment. But it's different than IDLE? Yeah, IDLE's terrible. Uh, IPython's pretty good. This is something called, I always get it mixed up, uh, PT Python. Okay. It's really nice because it, uh, it does multi line editing. Mm. And then you have to hit oops, get all to enter to run, and then you can edit it. Makes it very easy to experiment. Okay. Yes, yeah, so now I is an issue. It makes it very easy. You can just poke around like this. So now instead we want to print something else. Let's also print out I uh, user. Oh wow. Okay, so the user object was I guess a full fledged user object but we just want we just want uh, I guess the login without looking too closely at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's gonna be much easier in Python. So it would be a little complicated to go because you would have to deserialize the entire message or at least down to where you want it. Mm -hmm. But to do similar things like this where you just want like two of the fields, there are more, there are libraries for Go. I remember one was called, I think, Go JSON. Yeah, easy to use JSON library. So instead of, Yeah, so instead of having to deserialize the whole thing, you say, I want like this nested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you say get object array. So you're not really deserializing it, you're just kind of on the fly telling it like exactly which field you want it to get and that it is a string. Mm -hmm. So that Python program we could have written in Go 
you know, something very similar to this without having to fully deserialize the data structure by telling it like what every field is and where it should expect it. So, cool. Yeah, it's a really cool presentation. Now. Thanks for doing that. Um, let's see. Can you um, stop screen? Uh,